Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mark Moss Show where we talk about, of course, the decentralized revolution, talking about how the world is changing as we look at it through the lens of politics, finance, and technology. And of course, that technology is Bitcoin that is changing the world. You know, I like to bring you some education, some 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 news headlines of the week so you can stay up to date, and of course, some interesting guests. And I am joined in the studio today with uh, Michelle Weekly. You can find her on Twitter at, at Michelle Weekly. Um, you know, Michelle, you have a pretty interesting story. Been around the world, lived in the Middle East, China. You know, a lot of people like myself, talk about a lot of those countries without ever having been there. You've done that. Um, now you say you're an anti-federalist freedom maximalist. Pretty interesting. Uh, what does that mean, an anti-federalist freedom maximalist? Sure. So as you said, I spent a lot of time abroad in really authoritarian countries. Um, and there's pros and cons to that. But I think ultimately, as we've seen since COVID, um, having the state be able to control everything that you do um, is not exactly a world that we want to live in. So I came back to the States in 2018 and moved to Florida. Um, and I am fighting for freedom from the controls of the federal government and as much so as possible from the state as well. So that's what you mean, anti-federalist? Yeah, I think the U.S. federal government has just taken way too much power um, and that they're seeking to be more and more like some of these countries that we see in the Middle East and Asia and sort of do away with states' rights. So, so where were you in the Middle East? I was in Dubai for several years and then I was working in China. I never actually lived in China, but I was there several weeks at a time in both Beijing and uh, Shanghai. Hmm. What were you doing in Dubai? I was working in the tech startup space. Um, so I worked at one of the opportunity zones there. And, and then I got recruited to work in foreign direct investment. And that's how I ended up in China working with one of their, the largest uh, land developers in China. What's a foreign direct investment? I mean, that just manages people that want to invest in the country? Yeah, so there's this whole massive ecosystem that I think a lot of people don't realize is even out there. Um, foreign direct investment is defined pretty simply as, you know, state and country level investment, whether it's by governments or corporations into governments and corporations in other countries. Um, but about 20% of the world's global trade goes through these foreign direct investment channels. And most of that is done through world free trade zones. And within those free trade zones, um, there's a lot of government regulations and red tape that just doesn't exist. So most of what we're seeing, everybody's fighting about all of these rules and restrictions that are being made. But it's all just sort of a show because nobody's even following those rules. They're utilizing these trade zones. Mm. How does that all tie in with, you know, globalist agendas that's going on over there? Sure. So I, when I got recruited to work in foreign direct investment, I'd never even heard of the World Economic Forum. Um, but that is the sort of epicenter of what's happening in foreign direct investment and global trade at that level. Um, so they're all, I think that there is an agenda at the highest level, not to sound, you know, like a conspiracy theorist, but um, they really want a one world government and for all of the governments to sort of say what its citizens can and can't do. Well, it's not that you think there is agenda. Of course, there's an agenda. They write books about it yeah. and they put it on the website. <laughs> right, uh, right. They're not really hiding it anymore. I think they used to a little bit, but not so much anymore. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've had we've had the you know the UN agenda 2020 and 2030. We got the World Economic Forum with Sustainable Development Goals. 
Uh, we got the books. I mean, they, they've told us what they want. I mean, the, to think that anybody thinks it's crazy that rich people might get together to discuss right. ways they could continue to build their empire. Like, of course they do. That's what, that's what everybody does. Right. We all do that. Um, so it's like, it's, it's not about an agenda or conspiracy. Of course it is. You know, they say, this is the thing that bothers me is that Harvard MBA did a study. Um, only 3% of people in the Harvard MBA program had written down goals. The people that had written down goals, um, averaged more than 10 times the combined income of the 97% that didn't have written down goals. And I believe and that. so the WEF has written down goals. Mm -hmm. Right. Bill Gates and George Soros have written down goals. Um, the UN has written down goals, but most people don't. <laughs> and that means they're way more likely to get their written down goals through, you know, when you get down to that. Um, jumping over to China for a minute, you said that you had worked in uh, financing real estate or real estate development over in China? Real estate development, yeah. Um, so we had a partnership with the second largest real estate developer, um, CFLD over there. And this was before the, um, all of the defaults that were happening. So have you seen firsthand, like all the ghost cities that are over there? I have, um, in, we, I was over there in 2016, 2017, and they gave us tours of Beijing and all of the, in, the industrial and residential development that was happening. And it was really, really wild to see because we would, we spent days um, going on these tours and they would take us out over, we'd go out in the helicopter and land in the middle of some city. And it was easy to land on the street because there were no cars. There might have been a couple of bikers who would stop by and stare. And then they would take us on a bus to what was basically a, a model home, but on a much, much larger scale. Um, they were model cities, sort of. If you think about going to a model home and a new construction site, you know, there's a couple of houses built and you can see the plots for the rest of the development. And so that's really what they were doing on a massive scale. And they were calling them cities, but nobody was living there. And they were wrapping all of those numbers up um, and claiming that it was real development. And it wasn't, it was just, it was, they were ghost towns. But even, I, it, this is one of the things that really started to break my mind out of the matrix and start to question kind of how it all functioned is every, while we were there, everyone pretended that everything was cool. Like no one said a single word about you claim that these cities are complete, but they're at 2% occupancy. And the last one we just went to was at 0% occupancy. Um, so there's hundreds and hundreds of these developments all over China. Just like that, just ghost cities everywhere. Yeah. G getting the numbers up, I guess. So, um, you know, I saw you tweet something uh, yesterday talking about uh, the Middle East and saying that uh, this is an excellent summary of what is legitimately the most important thing happening on the planet right now. I want you to explain that as somebody who's lived over there in the Middle East. I think it's, I think it's uh, kind of important to understand Sure. So a lot of people don't know that China has brokered a deal between Saudi and Iran. And those two countries, the, the Shiites and the um, Sunnis, which are two different type, the different Muslim population, they've been fighting for thousands of years. So this is really a huge, huge deal. Um, and I think that China... China's goal is dominance. China's goal is to overtake the U.S. as the world leader globally, economically, in, as a global dominance. And they're doing that by adding to BRICS. Um, and so they brokered a deal between Iran and Saudi, and now they're in conversations with both of those countries to join the BRICS alliance. So if that happens, then it's really, really going to weaken the U.S. position, and it's also de-dollarizing um, all of the oil trade. So with the new relationships that they're developing, now they're talking to Saudi about um, purchasing oil and selling oil in the yen 
in, which is something that they've just done with Russia. So I know you talk a lot about de-dollarization, and I think we're seeing that happen right now with this deal. So if they if 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 they broker peace, then they start globally cooperating with each other. Exactly, and it just sort of pushes the United States out of the picture um, because right now the United States involves itself in a lot of what's happening around the world. But if China is brokering peace between all the rest of the world, then we don't need to be involved. And so I think that they are strategically pushing the United States out of the room. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, um, everybody thought that Donald Trump was going to come in and be some psychopath. Uh, we can't have someone right. like him in. He's going to lead us to nuclear war. No, no, no. Right. And um, of course, before him, Obama was the, the number one, uh, you know, bomb dropper in the world. I think he was dropping like 12 bombs a day or something like that. Um, and Trump was going to lead us to nuclear war, but he actually had brokered peace in the Middle East as well. Right. Right. And a lot of people don't know that. Of course, it got no coverage. Yeah. So they were trying to nominate him for a Nobel Prize, a Peace Prize. Uh, right. For the first time in for however many decades, we actually had peace in the Middle East. And yeah. we didn't have nuclear war. And now here we right. are. The Middle East is on fire. We have nuclear war from potential three sides, potentially Iran and Israel going to nuclear war. We got Russia, obviously, over there, Ukraine, the United States. And then we have China over on the other side, potentially three nuclear war threats. It wasn't Trump. It was Biden that put us there. But to your point, um, the, the, the peace that was in the Middle East got destabilized. And now here we are making it look like it could be President Xi that could be the peacemaker, the, the kingmaker, which would be pretty bad. You know, um, even talking about, um, you know, just Russia and China, uh, they've tried to broker peace many times. They've tried to sit down and, and establish peace many right. times. Um, Israel has been there trying to establish peace, and the United States continues to say, no, 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 it can't happen. And I saw even just, uh, just uh, when President Xi was over there this week, all the leadership in the United States is saying, no, the, the, this, this could lead to a ceasefire. That would be so bad. I'm like, what? Like, right. That, it makes no lead into a ceasefire is bad. I thought that's what we want, right. isn't it? Like, in the, you right. know, oh, but that would allow Russia time to regroup. It's like, oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, I mean, to your point, if, if Xi turns into be the peacemaker, I mean, it, it pushes the United States out. The problem that I have is that um, and, and you've lived abroad, so you, you know better. But, you know, I hear a lot about uh, I haven't I haven't been in, in the Middle East. Um, or China. But I know a lot of countries don't necessarily like Americans all that much. Um, a lot of countries don't allow Americans to open bank accounts. They don't do, deal with the IRS and all those things. Right. And it seems like um, I had reported on uh, China put out a paper last month in February, uh, the Office of Foreign Affairs, People's Republic of China. And it basically said, the quiet parts out loud. Basically, China put the, the government of China put this paper out that went out to the whole world. And they basically said that the U.S. is the purveyor of terror around the world. They use the dollar for yeah, colonialism. Um, they extract value through seniorage. Um, they said that the dollar is the main source of instability. And they said that the United States has been behind every single color revolution since 2003. And so that's like... That's just like, look, we know what you're doing. The whole world sees what the United States is doing. In the United States, right. we have this viewpoint where it's like, oh, we're fighting for peace and democracy around the world. But the rest of the world is like, whoa, you guys are a terrorist organization, right? Um, yeah. And then I was so shocked and, and uh, saddened to see, I think two days ago, the president of Mexico is now saying, hey, look, the United States, you guys are bad characters. Like, this whole thing with Donald Trump right. that you're trying to do in New York, that, like, you, got, you guys are bad, what you're doing over here, colonialism, what you're doing in Ukraine. I mean, he denounced the whole thing. It's like the whole world seems to see this except for us. Is that uh, maybe yeah. a feeling or picture you got when you tra traveled or lived overseas? Absolutely. So I think as a whole, the people of these countries love American. I mean, American has really exported its culture. And so the everyday people that you meet they love Americans, but the governments themselves, they, like you said, they say the quiet part out loud. Nobody is afraid to say out loud what the U.S. is doing. And the fact is, is that the U.S. is involved in most of the wars and color revolutions and yeah. all of the upheaval that's happening around the world. Um, I was in 
China in 2016 when the election was happening here. And I'll have to tell you, everybody over there loved Trump. And they were so excited that we had this man who was going to stick up for our people. And the sentiment was so different when I came back to the United States in at the very end of 2017, so about 2018, it was really culture shock because I had no idea what was happening over here and the way that they had gone after him. Um, I knew that he was a polarizing figure, but I really had no clue that they had used him to further drive the divide that's happening here in the United States. And I think that that's only escalated and it's tearing this country apart. Um, yeah, it's crazy. And and now I saw today too, even now China is getting behind this uh, Nord Stream investigation. So it's like, um, you know, yeah. the U.S. put out or somehow some paper, some flimsy argument about some pro-Ukrainian group came out trying to deflect. Um, but like China's like, nope, we're going to get behind this. We're going to get behind this. We get the U.N. into this. But we can't have the U.N. do it specifically because of the United States uh, involvement. So, yeah, things things are uh, sliding fast. Times like this, uh, when things are breaking down, that we get massive amounts of change. It goes back to uh, Vladimir Lenin's quote of uh, days or decades where nothing seems to happen. Life doesn't change, but then there's days where decades seem to happen. And that's where we're at. And I, I say that quote all the time, but it's really, it's this disruptive change that leads to this, which of course is why like Klaus Schwab wrote the book, you know, COVID-19, the great reset. He was like, in this time, this pandemic is time to reimagine, you know, reset. And so they want to use these times and whew, we got something else coming in right now. Of course, as the banking system is collapsing, and the Fed is moving in to you know, reassure depositors that their money is safe, that the banking system is okay, it seems like they're also pushing some secret agendas through. What am I talking about? Well, I've been warning you. Lots of people are warning you. Take heed that central bank digital currency, CBDCs, are coming to a country near you. Now, we know China has pushed their CBDC out. I've talked about that extensively. Uh, but of course they have because they're a communist country. I've played you clips of the head of the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements, is like the, the central bank above all the central banks. Um, the head of the BIS, Augustin Carson, he says that uh, central bank digital currencies would not be like cash. With cash, you can move cash around, and we don't know what it is, but with central bank digital currencies, we will have total control. We'll know every single transaction, and that's what they want. But of course, getting it through in China in a communist country, I mean, it's communist, right? Getting it through the, the, the EU, I mean, it's almost communist, right? But what about in America? What about in the land of the free? What about in the United States? Now, we have something, you know, this, this pesky document called the Constitution that seems to get in the way every time these uh, authoritarian leaders want to try to push something through like this. And it, and it basically restricts what the Federal Reserve can do. It's the government that creates money, right? The Federal Reserve just controls monetary policy. And so to have a central bank digital currency where we have an account with the Fed, it's not really how things are done. But doesn't doesn't don't don't let these pesky laws get in their way. They're going to get their way through. And so, how do we get there? The old uh, analogy of how you'd catch a wild pig would be you'd put like a little bit of corn on the ground every day, and every day you put the corn, and then the kid, the pig would come and eat the corn, and then one day, one day there would be like one wall up and then the pig would still come and then another day there'd be like a second wall up and then the pig would still come and then eventually there's a third wall up and the pig comes every day and finally that fourth and final wall goes in and so it's this path of leading us there and so one thing that's a little bit too coincidental for me is that we're having a couple things going on. So obviously the banking crisis I've talked about extensively. Go back and listen to the last week if you want the deep dive intensive on what's going on. Also on my main YouTube channel, Mark Moss, I've been breaking that down in depth. But rather than try to rehash what happened, I don't want to go through that. But basically, the a couple of banks got into trouble. They had to be bailed out by um, the Fed. And basically, the, the government and the Federal Reserve are saying that uh, forget this FDIC thing because your limit's only 250 grand. We're just going to backstop all the deposits. So even if you have over the uninsured amount, we're going to cover that anyway. Then they're talking about backstopping every deposit in the banking system, which is $18 trillion. Now, 
if the Fed backstops all the deposits, that sort of means that I have an account with the Fed. Hmm. Now, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of steps that get us to this central bank digital currency, but ultimately it's a currency that's issued by the central bank. It's the Fed. Now, what about the digital part, Mark? Well, you might already be aware that over 80% of all dollar transactions are done digitally anyway. You probably use your debit card and your credit card and your Venmo and your PayPal and your wire transfers and your ACH and your direct deposits and your automatic bill pays. You probably already use all your money like that. Money is already digital. So we've already got the digital part. So all we need is the central bank part, right? We already got the digital part. We got the currency. We got the, we got the digital. And all we need left is the central bank part. But if the Fed backstops all the bank reserves, that effectively gives us an account with the Federal Reserve, and that is the part of the central bank digital currency. Now, but what, what about all the other stuff that you told us about, Mark? What about their ability to, you know, uh, control us and, and censor our transactions? Well, yeah, that's the danger of central bank digital currencies. They're programmable money. So they could program that money in advance, and they could say, hey, this group can do these things. This group can't. This group gets a positive interest rate. This group gets a negative interest rate. Uh, this group gets reparations. This group doesn't, things like that. This group, uh, you've gone over your carbon allotment. You can't get gas or you can't eat steak, things like that. The thing is, is that they know that the American people would never go for that. As a matter of fact, there's massive pushback. We saw this week uh, Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida is trying to pass legislation to prevent uh, central bank digital currencies from working in um in Florida. We've seen uh, Senator Ted Cruz in Texas trying to implement um, le legislation to prevent the central bank digital currency from happening. So there's still some good people out there fighting the fight. And so they know that they can't just switch us to a central bank digital currency. Nobody's going to want that. Uh, you're waking up enough. You're spreading the news and you should continue to do that. But what if we just sort of back in? We already have the currency. We already have the digital part. And now all we need is the account with the central bank or the Federal Reserve, and we're already there. So it's pretty interesting that this is the course of events that's happening. And at the same time as the Federal Reserve are shoring up dollar access for banks, the Federal Reserve announces, or I should say confirms, the launch of their own central bank digital currency. So they have a, uh, there's a central bank digital currency coming out called FedNow. I've talked about this extensively. They announced it a while ago, but it just so happens that, of course, it's resurfaced right now. And basically, the FedNow is not as bad as you think it is yet. It's always the slippery slope. So the, the Fed now is a system that allows central banks and banks to move money back and forth between themselves using something like a CBDC. So don't, it's, not, it's not for the public yet. It's just for us to use internally. But you see how the pig analogy is working, how the walls are starting to close in? First, we start using digital money. And then second, the banks have a problem, so they give us accounts at the Fed. And then third, the Fed rolls out a central bank digital currency, but it's only for them, you know, back, back channels between the banks. And then fourth, we just have accounts, our currencies directly with the Fed. And then finally, they start to add all those other uh, behavioral modification programmable things into the money because no one's going to go for it right off the bat so it's pretty interesting they announced this fed now um, it's launching it says that quote early adopters will complete a customer testing and certification program informed by feedback from the fed now pilot program to prepare for sending live transactions through the system so it's been announced since 2019 they've been working on it and now they're going to launch it. Uh, this is a big milestone. This is something to stay vigilant on. This is something to definitely pay attention to. You know, back the fighters, back Ron DeSantis, back, um, uh, back, back uh, you know, Tom Emmer and Ted Cruz and all these people doing it because they're inching this forward one way or another. Uh, we know what their ultimate goal is, and that is ultimate control. And so we have to be vigilant and watch out and stand for that. Zoom out. The world is breaking apart. As If you're not aware, there's a war going on uh, with, between the United States and Russia. Um, 
I'm not going to say Ukraine anymore. I'm, I'm just done with that. At this point, we know that the U.S. is in war with Russia. Of course, they tried to deny it. It's a proxy war, people said. They tried to deny that. Look, come on. We're at war. Uh, if, you need to, if you need any evidence, I think the um, Russian downing of an American drone plane is, is enough evidence. What is the United States doing flying planes over there in a war? And Russian planes are shooting it down. I think we're in a war. You might also have known that we've been sending hundreds of billions of dollars and weapons over to Ukraine. Some of our weapon systems are so complex, they take teams of people to run them, and they take teams of skilled people to run them. Yeah. So that's Americans over there. There's uh, American military special forces all around Ukraine getting ready to go in there. So look, we already know what's going on. And the U.S. is just continuing to get more and more involved in this. Like I said, that drone was really kind of like if anybody thought there was any line that maybe the U.S. wasn't, I think that's over. I think we know that by now. But the thing that bothers me is that now the whole world is basically being forced to choose sides. And that's a problem. When push comes to shove, what happens? So we saw this week um, President Xi from China went over to meet with uh, Putin over in Russia. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a good meeting if you're, if you're from America like I am. It wasn't good. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a chilling message that was sent to the West where President Xi was seeing, the, of course, they recorded a video and they released it. Remember, you only think what they want us to think, right? They, if, they're, if, they're, if they're recording a video and releasing that video, then they want us to see that video. And of course, in that video, President Xi calls Putin a dear friend. He says, quote, change is coming that hasn't happened in a hundred years. What is that change that they're talking about? And what does it have to do? Well, the change is the changing of the guard. No more, if they have their way, no more will the United States have the homogeny over the entire world. No more will the U.S. dollar be the homogeny, will, no longer will be the reserve currency or standard of the entire world, if they have their way. The BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South America, I'm sorry, South Africa, and lots of other countries now have joined, are rising up to challenge the West. And this is exactly what they're talking about. Um, China is in full cooperation with Russia. Now, you might, might ask yourself, why? Why are they? Well, for one, the U.S. is also attacking China. Now, I guess I cheer for that. I mean, I'm not for any type of war, but if I talked about it on my main YouTube channel, Mark Moss, you can go back and find it. But um, the United States, the Biden administration has attacked China and basically took away all their microchips. So sent them back to the dark ages. We have, um, we have put massive amounts of sanctions on them. We've slapped um, tariffs on their imports. So it's a financial war. And of course, they've voiced their opinion for taking over Taiwan. And we've said, if you go to Taiwan, we'll go to war with you there as well. And what China realizes is that the U.S. is no longer friendly. And that's fine. It's fine by me. Um, I don't think we should be friendly with China. China is a communist country. We shouldn't be bowing down to them. They have massive human rights abuses, and those need to be dealt with. So we shouldn't be friendly with China. So I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm, no, I'm no fan of communism or fan of China from that standpoint. But if you understand it from a geopolitical standpoint, you have to be willing to put yourself in both sides of the shoes here. So if you're China and you're being attacked, uh, you know, taking away your microchips, taking away your energy, sanctioning tariffs, etc., now you're depending on Russia. So now China and Russia have gotten cozied because China has to import over 85% of its energy. It means oil and natural gas. Well, where does it get that from? Well, it gets it from Russia. So it also gets lots of other commodities and minerals and things like that. So what happens if Russia goes down? Well, now China's all on their own. And they don't want to be on their own because the U.S. is already attacking them. So, of course, enemy of my enemy is my friend. So, of course, Russia and China are going to get together on this. Now, what about all the other countries, then, that are being forced to choose sides here? And this is where problems start coming in. You know, we've seen now Saudi Arabia saying they want to go over to the BRICS nations. We've seen Iran going over to the BRICS nations. We're at a point now where we're seeing 60, almost 70 percent of the world's population is now joining into those ranks. And part of the problem that I'm really seeing that's really starting to bother me and, and you need to be aware of is that from a U.S.-centric viewpoint, you know, we're the, we're the good guys. But, you know, there's always two sides to every story. 
sometimes there's three sides, right? There's both sides and, and there's the truth. And the problem that I have is that while we are constantly being told that misinformation is the biggest threat that we have, it seems that it's our own government that continues to lie to us. Now, I'm not saying that China is truthful or Russia is truthful either. I would imagine they probably lie even more than the United States does. The problem is that all of the political establishment are full of lies. And, you know, we have this Nord Stream pipeline that was blown up. I've talked about that extensively. And look, we've watched enough murder mysteries on TV and detective shows to kind of figure this out. You just follow the money. Who's got the motivation? If you look at the geopolitical game, it's always been trying to keep Germany away from Russia. If you take the economic engine powerhouse of Europe and you match them up with cheap energy from Russia, it's a pretty strong combination. We don't want that. And so where did the pipeline run? It went from Russia to Germany. There's a lot of people that don't want Germany to continue to have that. Well, there's actually not a lot of people. There's maybe one country that doesn't want that, the United States. Now, the United States is, of course, sending natural gas over to Europe. And so anyway, that, that happened. And then we have the Hirsch report that came out and said, look, I mean, he's one of the best investigative journalists, you know, with a track record decades and decades and decades, broke many big stories. And he wrote a very conclusive piece of evidence saying that it was the United States that did this. And then a very, very flimsy rebuttal argument came out saying that, no, it was some pro-Ukrainian team that did it. And that's been rebutted a hundred times from Sunday. Um, it, 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 it was so bad that it just, I mean, it's, it, it, it's so bad that it, it's just, I mean, it just, it just uh, alarm bells are going off of how fake that is. And so that only emboldens the rest of the world even more. As a matter of fact, now China is supporting a UN-led Nord Stream investigation. However, they're urging that uh, the U.S.-led Western nations have to abandon uh, the U.N. because they're afraid that the investigation will be tainted. We have even just online people who have, 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 have uh, poked holes all through that Nord Stream sabotage. And now the thing that really got to me this week was I saw the Mexican president is now on board with this. The Mexican president calls the U.S. State Department liars. Yeah, our friendly neighbor to the south that we need geopolitically as the world continues to break apart, which it is, the U.S. relationship with Mexico is going to be crucial for us. And as long as we have that, we're okay. They're directly on our southern border, and now the Mexican president is calling the U.S. State Department liars after the report, right reports. Uh, liars about what? Liars about everything. Liars about human rights abuses, liars about, uh, you know, drugs along the border, liars about the way they are handling um, the whole situation with Donald Trump. He called that out specifically. Um, liars about uh, how they deal with, uh, Mex with Mexico directly. I mean, this is bad. This is, this is really bad. And so what does that mean? What do you, why, why do you care about this? Well, as the world continues to decentralize, the money systems are going to continue to decentralize. The information systems will continue to decentralize. And so we need to stay one step ahead of it. Luckily for us, we have the global permissionless, borderless monetary system that is Bitcoin. So we, have a, we at least have a lifeboat to get into, but it's important to understand what's going on, and it's interesting to watch it. So I'd love to report on it. Let me know what you think. Hit me up on social media, at number one Mark Moss. Hit me up on social, uh, either uh, Twitter or Instagram. I'm pretty active on both. Of course, check out my YouTube channel, at Mark Moss, if you want to watch me and listen to me at the same time. And that's what I got. Thanks so much for listening.